Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Curious Teens Exploring Engineering. This event is sponsored by the Center for Educational Outreach at Johns Hopkins University Whiting School of Engineering in participation, uh, in partnership with the Office of Career and Technology Education in Baltimore City Public Schools, Office of College and Career Readiness in celebration of Career and Technology Education Month and Engineers Week. We have the pleasure of having Baltimore City Council President, Mr. Mosby, uh, here to welcome us to our event. Mr. Mosby, please go ahead and kick us off. Well, thank you, Erin. Um, this is, uh, you know, when I got the opportunity uh, or the invite uh, to participate in this, into, into this event, um, it, it's exciting to me. I absolutely love uh, talking to young folks about uh, science, technology, engineering, and math um, uh, because I kind of related to my story. Um, I was a Baltimore City public school student. Um, I had this idea in my mind of wanting to become an engineer. Uh, I had no idea how I was going to get there. And it was actually opportunities like this uh, and programs um, like Mesa, if you guys are familiar with that program. Uh, or different opportunities at Poly that really pushed me in towards um, the ability of doing that. Um, I say that because engineering, um, I'll say engineering, um, is um, what I look at as the universal problem solver. Uh, you know, many people ask me, like, how did you get into politics? I've always wanted to be a public servant. I always wanted to give back to my city. Um, and I think it's my background as an electrical engineer of that analytical ability, that problem solving ability that helps me to perform my job from a different perspective or a different place than some of my other peers who have been trained in other professions. Uh, so I encourage young folks, no matter what you wanna do in life, uh, be a doctor, be a lawyer, whatever, I encourage you, if you have the ability to go inside of an engineering track uh, to do that, uh, because the way, again, that your brain is shaped, the, the the rigor of the, the coursework, um, the challenges that are put in front of you are like no other. I know many of you are middle school and high schoolers uh, and you kind of have these dreams trapped in your mind about what you wanna do in life. Um, I'll ask that you do that on a regular basis, dream. So if you wanna be an engineer, think about exactly what type of engineer you want to become. If you want, uh, when you're gonna go to college, think about the college that you would want to go to. Uh, dream about the particular major that you want to major in. Um, it's not that you'll be locked into that, but the more and more you start exploring this field uh, of interest, uh, the more and more you'll identify what's unique to yourself, uh, as well as the more and more you'll take those progressive steps uh, in achieving those goals. You know, I tell you this not because I read it in a book or I saw it on television or someone told me to come on here today to tell you that. I tell you that because that was my living life uh, example. Uh, no one in my family had gone away to college, graduated college before. No one in my family necessarily, necessarily knew anything about uh, engineering, uh, but, um, uh, but there was a fostering uh, uh, environment uh, to propel and push me in that direction. You know, ultimately, I majored in something called electrical engineering. Um, at the pinnacle of my career, I managed the development, um, uh, construction and maintenance of uh, cloud storage data centers from a video network perspective uh, and a past telecom life. Uh, and again, you know, I look at that experience as being extremely rewarding, knowing about what cloud storage was before anybody really talked about it. We kind of talk about it now uh, as like, a, you know, general conversation. But engineering is a tremendous um, uh, avenue uh, for you to grow, for you to learn. Uh, and it's really, really important that if you're interested in it, that you continue to maintain that interest. Uh, and again, that you continue to dream. So um, I, I thank you all for this opportunity of presenting to you and talking to you today. If you cannot tell, I'm excited to talk to young folks about engineering. More young folks need to get involved in engineering. Uh, and the last thing I'll leave you with is literally the next four to eight years of your life, depending on if you're in middle school or high school, uh, will literally determine the way you live the rest of your life. So utilize programs and opportunities like this with the exposure that you're gonna get on this uh, panel discussion today. Um, uh, utilize opportunities like this to really dig in deep and try to identify exactly what you wanna become and how you wanna become, and again, dream big. Uh, and I know I said the last thing, but this is really the last thing. If your dreams 
aren't making you afraid, if you're not afraid of your dreams because they're so big and you have no idea how you're going to achieve them, if they're not that big, you're not dreaming big enough. You're at the ground floor of your life. You're at the ground floor of your careers. Literally, you can do and become whatever you want to become in life. It's all about the book that you write for yourself. You get to put the programs, the people, the individuals, the opportunities uh, in that book that you're going to take advantage of. Uh, and that's why this awesome thing called Dreaming works out. So thank you, Baltimore City Public School students. You all are amazing scholars. Those dreams that are trapped in your head, you can truly, truly achieve them. Please continue to go after them. Please continue to participate in programs like this. Thank you, Johns Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mosby. Um, that was a, a great welcome and a great introduction uh, to our panel discussion. We know that you have a busy schedule, and so we appreciate the time that you are able to spend with us, and we understand um, that you are going to leave us now. So I want to remind all of our audience members, um, thank you so much for attending, first and foremost. And just remember to keep yourself muted. Uh, you can send questions to our panelists in the chat, and we will try our very best to get to everyone's questions. We have four engineers from various fields here to answer your questions today. So let's get started and meet our panelists. Please introduce yourself and tell us what field of engineering you're in and what you find most exciting about it. And we'll go in this order, Adrian, Julia, Michaela, and then Joshua. Adrian, why don't you start us off? Hello, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's very nice being with all of you today. I'm super excited to talk about um, uh, the field I love so much and hopefully encourage your love for the field of engineering as well. Uh, my name's Adrian Johnston. Um, uh, the field that I'm currently uh, studying is chemical and biomolecular engineering. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, at Johns Hopkins um, uh, in that field. And what I like most about this field and the reason why I chose this field was uh, uh, the breadth of different opportunities that you have um, in chemical engineering. Uh, I remember my freshman year of college, I spoke with a professor um, concerning, um, you, you know, why chemical engineers, um, so why they do, uh, uh, you know, a lot of medicine and medical research now. And he gave me the interesting note that engineer, uh, chemical engineers actually morph into whatever the country needs at the time. So there was a time when chemical engineers focused a lot on metals. Then uh, later on, they focused more on polymers and plastics, uh, you know, a lot of recyclables and so on, and then energy. And then now a lot of chemical engineers are focused on, on, on the medical side of things. So I really enjoy that uh, uh, aspect of morphing with what the country needs uh, at the specific moment. So hi, my name is Julia Carroll. I am a structural engineer. So I worked for a bunch of years at a couple of different engineering companies designing bridges. Structural engineers also work on bridges, oh, sorry, uh, buildings and tunnels and things like that. But I was, I mostly worked on bridges. Now I'm back at Johns Hopkins as a graduate student. Um, what I think is really exciting about what I do is I have always loved building things. When I was a kid, you could not pry the Legos out of my hands. Building blocks, connects, all of those kinds of toys. Those were always my favorite. I was still asking for them for Christmas when I was like way too old to be asking for them. Um, it was just always really, really fun to me. When I got a little bit older, I also found out that I really like computers and I really like um, coding and programming and making things be automatic and, and having them do things more thoroughly than, than humans can do just by ourselves. Um, and so now I work in a field called design optimization, which is just a fancy way of saying I can find like the maximum or minimum of something. So basically I have the computer help me design maybe the strongest possible structure or the lightest possible structure or something like that. Um, and it's just, it's just really exciting to me to combine these two things that I have just always thought were really fun. Um, and I now I get to put them together and I get to see I get to see what I actually designed because the computers are, are fun in the in the process, but the structure is fun in the final product. Like I, there's, it, it gives me a picture or something that I can actually build. And that's just really fun to me. Thanks, Julia. 
Hi everyone, my name is Michaela Carruthers. Um, I'm currently pursuing my master's in engineering management at Johns Hopkins, but my background is in mechanical engineering. And um, my favorite thing about mechanical engineering is definitely in line with what everybody has already said, um, Julia, Adrian, and Mr. Mosby. You know, it allowed me to combine the things that I'm most excited about, but more importantly, or even like more exciting about that is that, uh, Every company needs mechanical engineers, whether it's Nike or United Airlines or Facebook or Apple, um, or even I guess like Deer Park who made this water bottle, they need uh, mechanical engineers and there will be a job for you at whatever dream company you have out there. So that's definitely the most exciting thing for me. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Samuel Ojo. I, uh, I studied mechanical engineering at Johns Hopkins uh, and did the master's in engineering management. And now I am working uh, at a refinery uh, for Chevron out in the West Coast. And what I find the most exciting about engineering, uh, specifically mechanical engineering, is being able to, to, to break things up and, and just take things apart and then figure out how to fix it. Uh, every day when I go into work, there's always something new or some challenge or some issue. And really being an engineer is being able to take what you have at your fingertips and figure out a way to solve that problem or fix the issue. And so that type of challenge and um, like, uh, new uh, challenges always excites me about engineering. Thank you. And Joshua, I'll stay with you for a second. Your background, I'm really curious. Is that where you work now? Yes. So it's kind of morphed a little bit into software engineering, uh, something that I learned in college and I would encourage you to also take a look at is uh, computer science and, and, and working with computers. A lot of engineering is coupled or joined together with some sort of programming. So having um, some sort of knowledge on how to write code or at least understanding code um, helps you in the long run because, for example, in my current position, I'm in smart engineering and what I do has to, uh, it, it involves taking equipment and figuring out how to have the equipment tell us when it needs to be replaced or when something goes wrong. And so we're building these smart facilities that kind of tell us when things are going wrong because at a refinery, uh, we can't afford uh, something bad to happen. You know, it'll cost a lot of um, money and um, there's environmental impact. So we're building all of these systems that tell us, hey, my my screw's not on tight, or hey, um, this is getting really, really old, we need to replace it. And so a lot of computer science and mechanical engineering join together to make that happen. Thank you. Wow, that sounds like a fascinating field. I want to pivot now over to Julia and ask, what was your first introduction to engineering? Yeah, um, when I was in, I think it was middle school or maybe early high school, I took a, a geometry class, um, you know, we all had to, and I found it really exciting. We learned to do these things called compass and straight edge drawings, where you can basically use the relationship between shapes to, to draw things precisely, even without measuring. So you can, you know, find the exact midpoint of a line, even without a ruler. Um, and I just thought it was really fun. I always liked shapes. I like spatial things, the way things fit together. Um, I came home told my parents about it. I was so excited. My dad took me to the library and showed me a bunch of books on technical drawing and drafting, which led to a bunch of books on architecture and engineering. Um, and I just started reading on these like different branches of engineering and things like that. And I just, it, that, the rest was history. That was, that was the moment. <laughs> and it was all, th I was luckily, lucky to have a parent who knew these things and, and could point me in the right direction. Um, but it all came out of my, my love of shapes. Who knew? <laughs> They're fundamental, right? Um, does anyone else want to answer that question before I move on? I can go ahead and chime in. Um, my experience or my introduction to engineering is probably very different. Um, I wasn't really introduced to engineering until probably my freshman year of high school when my physics teacher made it a project for everyone to make a brochure on what engineering is and why people should go into it. 
And prior to that, I really had no idea what engineering was. I didn't understand why my teacher was like pushing it onto us. I didn't understand what physics had to do with engineering. I was like, why are we talking about this? How is this related um, to, to our classes? But then, you know, fast forward three years later when I was applying to colleges and when I was thinking about, uh, you know, what I wanted to do, that stuck out in my mind because I learned, you know, how much money engineers can make. I learned, um, you know, that if you're good at math or if you even like math, that this could be a route for you. Uh, you know, other than going into like finance or something that I thought was maybe basic. Um, so <laughs> it was uh, it was a different introduction for me, but but that was my first time. Thank you. Uh, yes, salaries are definitely important um, and can make a big difference in what you decide uh, is um, uh, the field that you want to pursue. Um, switching over to Adrian. So what does a typical day look like for you? Ah, uh, yes, a typical day. Okay, so as a PhD student, and by the way, I'll preface this by saying, um, you know, the reason why I actually chose to do PhD, my PhD uh, uh, in chemical engineering is because I wanna focus a lot on research. Um, uh, you, you know, so some chemical engineers could go right after um, they get their bachelor's degree and they can, you know, work for a company directly or you can go into uh, graduate school um, uh, to kind of focus a bit more on research. So a lot of my day um, uh, is actually doing just that. Um, so I come in um, and I'll uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, do a lot of immune system work. Um, and that you know, term might actually sound familiar to you given the pandemic that we're in. And everyone now is talking about the immune system. Um, and uh, you know, so how do you get your immune system to recognize uh, COVID? And that's of course by you know, the vaccine. Um, so the work I do isn't specifically COVID related, but um, it is working on the immune system and looking at how it uh, it could actually be used to uh, to help people uh, recover or get better from cancer, um, so it's really a bunch of research now. So if you really like to uh, do a bunch of experiments, uh, then I think you know uh, doing a PhD is or even masters is a great uh, route for you. Thank you. And Joshua, do you want to answer that question as well? What does a typical day look like for you? Yeah, um, and I'll actually give uh, two different types of days. So my typical day um, back before COVID, because it's changed a lot. Um, when I get into the refinery, we have sort of a group meeting day where we kind of discuss any of the new or urgent things that have come up from either the week before or previous days, and we divide out the tasks that need to be done around the refinery. And so we then go about inspecting uh, some of our equipment and sensors, making sure they're uh, on point. And then the other half of the day is spent sort of redesigning uh, a new part of our facility that we're using for a new type of equipment. That's usually my um, regular day, but uh, on my irregular days, which happens about twice a year, um, we do these things what are called shutdowns. And um, you can see behind me, that's an example. My background is um, one of our refineries. And what we do is we go in and we replace all the equipments in the refinery, right? And we do this in order to ensure that we're meeting up with um, safety regulations. And this process is a big, about one month long um, um, procedure where we hire a bunch of contractors, a bunch of different people. We come in, we rip the whole refinery down, and then we build it back up with new equipments. And what I've always found fascinating about that is the amount of uh, uh, preparation and uh, being very attentive to detail and ensuring that everything goes right. We do all the right pre-safety check and um, all of those steps because uh, each day the equipments are turned off, the company's losing, I think, upwards to one to $5 million 
And when you start thinking about that and uh, you're at the refinery and you, and you said to yourself, wow, this day that we didn't turn it on, we've lost this amount of money. <laughs> and to me, that, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. I wish I had that type of money. But just, just being aware of the sort of implications with ensuring that we execute um, with precision and with accuracy and ensure that we turn on our systems at the predicted day uh, plays a big role. And to me, it, it, it gets me excited. Um, but I will tell you, <laughs> a lot of us are stressed for that month. I can imagine. And it sounds like a huge endeavor. Um, looking at your background there, I can only imagine all the components and pieces uh, that it takes to um, uh, make that work and function. So um, safety is key. Uh, so they might be losing money, but you know what? They're saving lives and, and becoming more efficient. Um, That's correct. So I'm going to jump over to Michaela now and ask, what is one thing about your career or field you wish you would have known as a middle school or high school student? So that's a great question. Um, definitely what I wish that I knew about my career um, when I was in middle school and high school, it goes back to, um, again, what Mr. Mosby said and what I found most exciting about engineering. You know, I wish that I knew that, um, once you have this degree, you can really do anything. You know, um, with an engineering degree, there's a certain level of respect that people have for you just from having that degree. And it sounds really silly. And I didn't believe people when they told me that. I was like, why would anybody think anything special about me just because this piece of paper says my name and engineer on it? Um, but it's really true. You know, saying that you're an engineer, it implies that there's a certain level of thinking and problem solving that you can do. It implies that there's uh, a certain level of, you know, grit and perseverance that you'll bring to your to your workplace or to whatever you do, because engineering school is not easy. Um, so I wish that I knew that, you know, just because I'm saying I'm going to engineering school, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be a computer scientist or that I'm going to be like wearing a hard hat or I'm going to be doing something that I don't want to do. Um, being an engineer means that now the door is open for you to do absolutely anything. Does anyone else want to answer that question? I guess I'll just actually add in one thing just to um, give a scope of like what engineers can do. Obviously, the four of us have all very different experiences. Um, but even myself, I'm 22 years old and I've worked on airplanes. I've worked on research for coronavirus and um, how it affected the medical supply chain. And I've also worked on like data centers and cloud computing. Um, so it's just a wide range of things that you can do with a degree. Yeah, and to, to chime in a little bit on that, I've, I've also worked in the health field, I've worked in the utilities, um, doing software engineering. There's so many different things that you could do with just one, one engineering degree. And so I would encourage you uh, to explore everything and anything that you can get your hands on. Yeah, to add to Josh's point, like if you if you just want to explore what engineers can do, you can always just look at the LinkedIn pages of people who are in positions of jobs that you already like. And if you look at their backgrounds, I'm sure you'd find that a lot of them have background in STEM. I like that. Yeah, sleuthing around, uh, look for the <laughs> look for uh, uh, keys and um, information about um, people that you admire, check out their backgrounds. I like that. Um, so now we're going to pause from questions for a moment to share some information with you, our audience, about our Whiting Internships in Science and Engineering program. WISE is a paid internship opportunity for Baltimore City High School students in 11th and 12th grades who are interested in working with Hopkins engineering faculty and graduate students on research projects. So for more information, you can visit engineering.jhu.edu slash outreach. And now we'll go back to our question session. Panelists, uh, hope you're ready. 
Let's start with, we'll kick it over to Joshua. We'll come, we'll come back to you. So what is your proudest accomplishment related to the work you've done? Ooh, that is a, that is a, that is, that's a good question because it, it forces me to look back. I've been working so much that <laughs> sometimes it, it helps to take, 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 take a look back at what you've been done and be proud of what you have done and where you're at and also to look forward to what you're going to accomplish. Um, for me at work, I think um, not necessarily uh, what I've done, but what my team has done. And we have been working a lot to really bring technology into the refinery. And one of my recent projects has to do with HoloLens. So I'm not sure if you guys have um, seen uh, the, the Oculus Rift or those big um, goggles that you wear on your head and you can visualize different um, video games. Uh, but what we're doing is we're taking those same equipment and using it to kind of act as a third eye for engineers. And it allows engineers to, for example, see uh, how fast the water is moving in a pipe. We call that uh, the flow rate. And so the cool thing about enabling uh, engineers to do that is when they go around the refinery, uh, they can quickly identify uh, different things that either look, um, look strange or if things look normal. And my team, uh, this, this was never done before in Chevron. So my team kind of took that project on. We're really excited. We got all of these cool gadgets and we were uh, walking around the refinery with these big goggles and uh, people were looking at us strange. They're like, what, what, what are those kids doing? Because we're all sort of new and, and uh, 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 college graduates and uh, they're much older. So they thought we were just kind of playing around with these toys. But uh, it, for me, I was really proud to be able to show um, how things like that could effectively improve how we operate. So the main goal was, hey, how do we take this tool and how do we make it better for our day, uh, day to day, make us more efficient with uh, the information we have and being able to showcase that. Uh, I was really proud because it, lay, it led to an initiative um, with the whole smart engineering and improving the safety standards of our refinery. That's great. And hopefully you didn't uh, run into anything with your, <laughs> with your goggles on. <laughs> Yeah, we, we did a couple of times, but we, 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 we love to fail. There's something called a fail fast, right? So when, when we try new things, we always encourage people to try new things. Uh, we say, uh, try new things and fail fast and keep going. So uh, it's kind of like this process where you're encouraged to do new things, but if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And then you go on to the next new thing. That's right. The progress we can learn from failure. Um, switching over to Adrian, can you tell us about what you're most, uh, what you feel most accomplished about? Um, and I'm going to kind of make a joke. Um, in graduate school, uh, you know, um, you're kind of like Joshua was saying, you know, fail fast. Uh, you kind of meet a bunch of uh, failures at first. And when things begin to work, you, you get pretty excited. Um, so, so in my lab, uh, you know, I think that's why I kind of enjoy PhD. Um, I was actually able to bring in my own project uh, and pitch it to, to the professor's, uh, professor whose lab I'm working in, um, you know, and uh, I and a few other lab mates, we actually brought in, uh, in uh, a big immunology focus um, to the lab um, and started uh, being able to get, you know, uh, patient uh, blood and so on and so forth uh, to be able to look at immune cells. Um, so I think, you know, um, doing a lot of focus in cancer research uh, concerning immunology is, is uh, bringing it into this lab is probably uh, something that I'm pretty excited about. That's great. I would get into, you know, whether or not you have any patents, but I don't want to put you on the spot. Can I hear from Julia? Can you tell us what your uh, greatest accomplishment so far has been? 
Yeah, sure. I'm thinking um, the first sort of technical accomplishment that comes to mind is several years ago, I was working on um, a contract for the state of Rhode Island where we had to investigate a bunch of their bridges. These were bridges from the 1800s that didn't have a lot of information and were designed long before computers. And all of them had weight limits on it saying that, you know, the, the heaviest trucks in the state weren't allowed to go over it. Um, and we figured out a way to, we built computer models of the bridges and we partnered with this um, live load testing company. So this company that would drive heavy trucks over the bridges, put a bunch of sensors on the bridges and take that data to see how the bridge was responding to the heavy load. We, it was one other engineer and I, we figured out how to take that information from the testing, put it into the computer model. And we showed that out of, I think it was something like 31 bridges that actually 24 of them were totally fine and they could open them back up to heavy truck traffic, which was really cool. Um, and it was all because we sort of problem solved together. We figured out how to use the tools at our disposal. Um, that's the technical accomplishment on the sort of the personal side of my career. Um, I'm hoping to finish my degree in this next coming year. And when I do so, I will be the first black woman to get a PhD in my department. So I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> Cheers to you, and you keep up the um, the hard work, and, and definitely keep in touch with us so we can celebrate that with you. That will be an amazing accomplishment. Uh, Michaela, please tell us, what are you most proud of? So this is really funny that I'm being asked this because I, <laughs> when I saw this question, I was like, oh, you know, my imposter syndrome kicked in. I was like, nothing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, listening to everybody here, um, all really inspiring. And so it, it did make me think a little bit. And so I guess what I'm most proud of um, in my career is on my first day of my uh, internship at United Airlines back in 2018. So I was a sophomore in college. Um, my manager gave me like this, like 3D printed part. So just like a piece of plastic, basically. And was like, here you go. This is yours. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you're gonna learn about this. And throughout the three months that I was there, I learned that this part was basically a part that had been passed around from engineer to engineer, um, really avoiding doing the project. And it was just a really undesirable project. So that's how it became the intern's work. Um, I returned to United Airlines for two more internships. So I interned with them for a total of nine months, I guess, spread out over about two years. And it wasn't until um, the last month of my <laughs> final rotation, so a whole year later, that I was able to um, wrap up that project and get this part installed on the inside of the plane. And so now if you are on a United Airlines aircraft and you see in the galley, you see the flight attendant reaching up on the wall and pulling paper towels out of the wall, please know that that is because I put that there. I um, did all of the engineering work to approve that being mounted on a curved wall that nobody else wanted to do. And it did take me a year and it did you know, require a lot of learning and a lot of research. And um, you know, there was a whole lot of work behind it, but it's my proudest accomplishment by far. Love it. And, and hopefully soon enough we'll we'll be uh, traveling again more freely and we can appreciate that um, uh, on, our, on our next United flight. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. Um, let's go back to Adrian. And again, anyone is welcome to answer this question, um, but I wanna know as a person of color, did you face any challenges in your field? Uh, if so, what kinds of challenges did you have to overcome? Um, and and how did you overcome them? Of course, um, you know, uh, I think in general, as engineers, we all face challenges. But um, as a person of color specifically, um, you know, depending on the school you go, uh, you could be the only, or, uh, you know, either the only person of color or a handful, or one of a handful of people of color, uh, you know, uh, in your entire cohort. Uh, in your entire class. And that can be tough sometimes, especially when, you know, all engineers struggle um, and, uh, you know, looking around and not seeing uh, someone or many people who look like you um, uh, in your classes 
when you struggle, you kind of feel like, is this right for you? Um, you know, is it really tough us specifically for people of color and so on and so forth? But um, I think two things helped me overcome that. One, the first I would say is having a support network of people. So not just people in your class, it could be administrators. Um, uh, you know, the interesting thing is everywhere um, I went, uh, so I started off in Montgomery College in Montgomery County, um, transferred to University of Maryland, and then I came uh, here to Hopkins for PhD. But at each one of those, I had a support network of people who always encouraged me, who always pushed me uh, to keep going. The second thing is to step out of your shell. Um, a lot of time at Maryland uh, during my undergraduate, uh, I kind of did work on my own. Um, whereas when I came to Hopkins, uh, I really stepped out of my shell and started doing work together with my classmates. And, and, and I think, you know, you kind of learned that even though, you know, we're all different colors, um, uh, we're all from different backgrounds, we all share similar experiences um, in some cases, and we're all there to encourage one another. So I think those things helped me out. The support network, of people, but then also uh, your own core folk. Even if you end up in a class um, where you don't have many people who look like you, um, I would say step out of your shell um, because you'd be surprised to find that you know all those people are 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 there alongside you, and you all are going through this entire journey together. Thank you. Right. Don't stay isolated. Uh, support networks are key and they can be made up of people that um, you might not have thought uh, of initially. Right. It doesn't just have to be family. It doesn't just have to be friends. Um, think about the people in your community, um, in, in your cohort, uh, in your schools. Um, so lots of opportunities to establish a support network and Going back to that that topic of, of struggle, of struggling um, and, and dealing with those challenges, um, can you talk a bit about um, your your struggles with math um, and, and how you were able to navigate uh, those situations? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so math, uh, it's funny. Um, in high school, uh, I actually went to three different high schools. <laughs> uh, I started off in Maryland um, uh, uh, at a school called DeMatha in Hyattsville. Um, and, you know, I went there freshman year because we were thinking of moving to Maryland. I'm originally from New Jersey. Uh, sophomore and junior year, we went back to New Jersey um, at, uh, and I went to a school in New Brunswick. And then after that, I transferred because the school actually ended up closing for senior year. So during that time between junior year and senior year, um, we had to do a summer class um, for pre-calculus. Now all this time beforehand, I thought I was a whiz at math. I was doing very well at math. It would get to the point where I wouldn't study much and I'd be okay. But then pre-calculus that summer, and then, um, you know, for a bit of background, in the summer, the summer classes are usually pretty more intense because there's not enough time. Uh, you don't have the same length of time that you're learning the material. So that summer pre-calculus comes and it hits me and and I start, you know, not doing well as I used to. Um, and I think what helped me out during that time um, was again, the support network from, from my family. But then also um, one thing I learned during that time that I still carry with me today is doing, you know, just doing the problems over and over and over again until it becomes almost muscle memory. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting, it, at least for me, that, that's been very helpful for me with math is doing the problems over and over again until it becomes somewhat muscle memory. Thank you. Anyone else want to share their um, uh, advice on uh, struggles with math in particular? I think I just like to sort of echo what Adrian said. So I, uh, similar in high school and again in college, whenever I had to take probability and statistics classes, uh, that always 
that was just really hard for me to wrap my head around. I was always pretty comfortable in math. And usually I like, I like having a right answer. That's one of the things that I like about math and probability is messy. And that is not my thing. Um, and it was just, it just, it wasn't how my brain worked. And I just, it, I could never get it to click. Um, and I could, you know, sort of follow the rules and memorize what I needed to, to get through a test or something like that, but it just never made sense. Um, and like Adrian said, some of it was just a matter of just keeping at it. It was just a lot of perseverance. In fact, for me, it didn't click until I took it a third time in my master's program. Um, in which case I actually kind of developed a little bit of a, a little bit of tension with the professor because I would ask a billion questions in class and he thought I was trying to make him look bad and like I was trying to stump him, but I was really just trying to understand because it just, it just wasn't working. But, you know, I, I kept at it and I, I worked with other students in the class. I got help from people when I needed to. And if I just, if I just stuck with it eventually still, you know, I'm not ever going to be a statistician. It's not my thing, but I, I, I get it enough now. And it's just because I was able to just keep trying. I actually want to like add into that because I wasn't going to comment about math struggles, but Julia, you are so right. <laughs> there are, there's always going to be that class, whether it's some math class, even though you're great at math or some science class, even though you're great at science that gets you. And when it does, just don't let it knock you down. Like Julia is so right. There's you, you, you're just never going to be good at it. Like, yeah, I'm okay. I won't say that, but I am never going to be good at probability and statistics. And I've accepted that, but I didn't let that stop me from trying to get through the class. And I didn't let that stop me from trying to be an engineer. So even though we all stand here and we say, oh, to be an engineer, you need to be really good at math and science. Like, it's okay. You don't need to be an expert at math and science. You need to be an expert at, at learning and trying to be the best that you can be at it. So that's, that's definitely a, uh, my, my two cents on that. I just want to jump in to just say one more thing. Um, so, so I also wanted to add, um, you know, uh, in graduate school, when we started taking our graduate school courses, you know, a lot of it, we made the joke where chemical engineering is basically just math. Um, but, uh, you know, our first year courses were pretty difficult. And I found that, you know, uh, working together with my classmates in math was a big thing. And I don't say this as, you know, just a general thing. I was talking with my nephew, um, you know, during this whole virtual learning uh, 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 scenario that, of course, everyone um, finds himself in now during this time. And he said that, you know, I, I called him. He said he'll call me back because he's he's working with some classmates right now through Zoom. And I told him, I'm so proud of you because I wish I knew that at your age. I know that now that I should work together with my classmates, but at that age. I did not do that. So I wish I had known that. So I would definitely say work together because you all will talk about things and you all will make jokes about math and so on and so forth. And it'll just help uh, uh, the content stick uh, uh, in your minds and in your memory. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, this will be the last thing. I, I swear, I promise. But Adrian, you just reminded me that, yeah, like engineering is all about problem solving. So whenever I found myself struggling in a class, I just look at it as, you know, the problem is I'm struggling and how am I going to solve that problem? And it's not always that I'm going to solve it by going through it and being good at it. Sometimes it's that I'm going to get help from my professors. I'm going to get help from my classmates. I'm going to be sitting there Googling everything that the professor is saying right after they're saying it, you know, whatever you have to do to solve your problem at hand, like that's what makes you a good engineer, not like the grades that you're getting in your classes. I love all of this. And Joshua, did you want to add something? I think I think they got it all. Um, I did want to make uh, one quick note on um, uh, facing different challenges as a person of color. Uh, in in my case, I moved across the coast, so I went all the way from Baltimore to um, California, and I knew nobody. And when I started uh, at my first day, um, most of my cohort and people that worked at Chevron were. Um, where we were not people of color. And so I struggled for a little bit, um, just sort of re, uh, re, re relating with other workers and um, getting friends. 
Uh, and one thing that really helped me was uh, at Chevron, there's, um, they have these groups called employee networks. You can sort of think of them as like clubs. And uh, there was a black employee network. And so I got myself plugged into that because uh, coming from college, I was involved with Nesby and a lot of different black organizations. And so uh, I felt like, oh, okay, this is something I'm kind of used to. And I, I took it for granted at first, but the older I got, the more I appreciated programs like that because you're able to meet um, other, uh, not not just other Black people, but or people of color, but also people who are in different positions, and you can form mentors. And and mentorship is such a uh, a key, unique piece of um, my life now because I get to almost you get to almost gain all the knowledge from someone without spending the years to gain that knowledge. And I found that to be very priceless because they helped me with. Um, not just like interpersonal relationship, but how to do uh, some of my engineering work, um, what to look for, um, what to apply to, and just key things that you wouldn't get from either your supervisor or from uh, uh, someone else. And so what I want to encourage you guys to do is um, to look for mentors and mentors could be could be us one one of these panelists you could reach out to them or on linkedin um you could reach out to people if one thing i found is uh people are always they always love to talk about themselves and what they do and if if they're of color and you're of color it's even there's a it's such an amiable atmosphere where someone just loves to see other people make it and they want to share that knowledge and they'd love to see you make it as well and Joshua, in the last 30 seconds before we take our second break, can you um, just tell us briefly what NSBE is? Of course. Yeah, so NSBE is the National Society of Black Engineers. Uh, it is a both a collegiate program as well as a high school program. So some high schools have NSBE clubs. And uh, in NSBE, there's a multiple things that you could do. NSBE helps you to prepare for uh, your, your workplace. So things like uh, professional presentations, prepping your resume, applying to different, um, to, uh, different internships and uh jobs we also have these conferences where you go in and you get to talk to all of these different uh, recruiters from top companies i'm talking like facebook apple boeing like the whole spectrum they all come in and they want black engineers so it's it's almost like you are the celebrity and they're they're like trying to like take your picture um and a uh, nesby enables that uh, as well as that, they also have different programs to help the community too. So um, I know at Hopkins, we did um, a, a after school program with one of the high schools and uh, some other volunteering around the community. Thank you. That sounds like a great experience and a wonderful opportunity uh, for our students of color to look into uh, the National Society of Black Engineers. And, and we've got a link going um, in the chat, so we'll make sure that that goes out. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a quick break right now uh, for a message from our Engineering Innovations Program. Picture modern day life with you at the center of innovation. As a high school student with an excellent track record in math and science, you are invited to apply to Johns Hopkins Engineering Innovation. It's an intensive but fun program where you'll tackle hands-on challenges, test theories, and learn to think like an engineer. And you have the opportunity to earn three Johns Hopkins credits. Apply now, ei.jhu.edu. Great. Welcome back. This will be our final session of questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left before we wrap up. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Michaela. Michaela, can you please tell us um, what are the most highly recommended summer and part-time jobs uh, that will provide the greatest insight to teens interested in various fields of engineering? Um, internships, internship experience is also welcomed here. Yeah. Um, so I would say that at this stage in your academic career as a middle or high school student, um, any internship experience will be helpful. When I was in high school, I actually interned at a law firm and just like helped out with um, assistant work. And that was just good to show um, 
to show my professional ability. But then going into college, um, I did speak about a little bit about my internship with United Airlines. And just to share that experience with you all, um, I guess I just want to say that, you know, when you're an intern, companies will treat you just like you are a full-time employee. Um, and they will expect that same amount of work from you as well. But being treated like a full-time employee um, can just reap so many benefits just as an intern. So yeah, as a sophomore and junior in college, I was an intern with United Airlines and received um, full flight benefits. So I was able to fly for free anywhere that United flies to, which is anywhere in the world. Um, so I actually went to 11 different countries through the company. Um, I visited London on the weekend, Tokyo, Hawaii. I was given buddy passes so I could take my boyfriend with me, my friends with me, my mom with me if she wanted to go somewhere. Um, and again, like this is just as an intern. And so it's just kind of to show that Again, as an engineer, people will have a certain level of respect for you that they will hire you to positions to do very serious work. But with that very serious work comes like some really awesome benefits that I don't think that I would have ever been able uh, to travel to 11 countries by this age. And I never imagined that I would have, so. That sounds amazing. Um, yes, we all, um, uh, like the idea of, of having uh, opportunities to, to travel and, and be as flexible in our careers as possible. Uh, Julia, uh, did you also want to answer this question? Yeah, sure. Um, I also wanted to mention so that internships, traditional internships can be really difficult to obtain. Even once you're a college student, it, it's a lot of, um, you have to know the right people sometimes. Um, there are programs out there like Inroads, and I, I know there's others that I'm blanking on the names of that help high school students, specifically underrepresented minorities, get connected with STEM internships. But one of the things, at least from, from the structural engineering, and I assume the same goes for mechanical and, and electrical, um, jobs in the construction industry are actually a pretty good primer. Um, they help you see the different parts of what goes into building something. Um, it helps you, you also get to work with engineers, even if you're the one building something, there's usually engineers that are involved in the project in some form or another, and you can talk to them, pick their brains, um, and even, and then if you do go into engineering, having that experience will make you such a better engineer, because I have worked with people who have never built an actual thing in their life, and they can do all the math, and they can understand the physics, but they don't have a good sense of, of how the parts fit together, um, and the ones that do, whether it was, you know, like I said, playing with Legos, or whether you were, you know, putting like uh, shingles on roofs when you were a teenager, it actually, it really helps you think through the whole problem start to finish and understand that these things we draw on paper, what they look like in real life. Can I uh, add one thing to that? Um, so when, when I was in high school, um, uh, I didn't do any internships or um, internships were a little bit harder to get. And so if you're facing something similar, I would encourage you to just make one. Um, what I ended up doing was um, I contacted um, a professor at my community college and I was I asked, hey, do you have any research or anything that you're doing? Um, I'm really interested in learning about, um, I think back then it was uh, 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 craters. And so he had a project where he was um, figuring out a way to analyze uh, what were craters and what were dust devils on Mars through image visualization. And so I got involved with that. And so what I want to encourage you, if you're unable to get a, a formal internship, is uh, create something, um, if it's something that you like, or you can go to Hopkins website, uh, look at a list of different professors, look read a little bit of what they're doing and if it's something that interests you reach out to them and ask hey i have the summer free and i'm really interested in what it is that you're doing uh, will it be okay if you know you either meet once a week or if we uh, create some sort of program where i could uh, get my hands dirty with this research or learn about what you're doing and um sure enough that experience will give you just as much knowledge and um a professional um exposure as a formal experience uh, internship with. Thank you, Josh. And of course, through our center, uh, we always, um, our mission is to connect students with ho the Hopkins community. Um, and so we, we are always um, there with open arms, uh, ready to work with our Baltimore City youth um, in, in different capacities. 
this is going to be our final question for all the panelists to answer. Uh, we have about two minutes left before we uh, have our closing remarks. So we'll just go Joshua, Adrian, Julia, and Michaela. Uh, please answer this question. What is one piece of advice that you would give students who may be interested in engineering or more specifically your field of work? Uh, my piece of advice would be uh, to, to not give up. Um, I know, at least for me, there was a lot of different challenges, both from academics to um, the work I was doing to uh, the people I was working with. So I, I, I would encourage students to keep pushing and find what it is that, that, that um, uh, uh, keeps them going. So if it's either networking, networking with other uh, uh, people of color who are engineers or finding mentors or um, uh, doing your side project, whatever, whatever it is that keeps you going, go ahead and find it and use that to push you through the different challenges you face. So I'd say um, connect with people as much as possible. Uh, so not just with classmates, but as I was saying before, with administrators at your school. Um, you know, so, so not only for professional reasons, but also because these people are cheering you on, they're encouraging you. So that could be professors, that could be the director of the student union, that can be um, counselors, so on and so forth. Um, you know, and these people always have your best interests at heart. And anytime anything will come up, they'll always remember you and and uh, and pass that opportunity on to you. So I guess my advice is sort of a combination of what was just said, um, which is, first of all, I, I really want to echo what Joshua said about keeping the focus on, on what it is that you want and why you want to do it and letting that power you through the challenges. But also what Adrian is saying is um, there, what, what I hear, <laughs> my, what resonates with me is that mentors and advocates come in unexpected places. Um, and, you know, you may be the only woman or the only person of color or the only LGBT person or something like that. And you never know, sometimes the old white man will be your best champion because you just happen to have a connection with this one person. Um, and you just, you just never know where, where that connection is going to come from. So if you find something, find somebody that you connect with, then, then lean on that and, and ask them for their advice, ask them to advocate for you when you're not around. If they if they believe in you, then they will, they will help you get opportunities. And so you just look for those connections, even if they're somewhere you don't expect them to come from. All right, so it's gonna be hard to give good advice after all of the wonderful advice that was already given. Um, but my piece of advice is to leverage every opportunity and experience that comes your way. And so when I say that, I just mean, you know, everything, every experience, every part-time job, every interaction that you have with people, um, you know, look back and see what did I get out of that? What did I learn from that? What did I accomplish when I did that? And take note of it. And you'll find that that will be um, your best resource when you're applying to jobs, when you're networking, when you're talking to people, you'll be able to look back and say, you know, from this experience, this is what happened. This is what I did. This is what I got from it. Um, and it'll just, it'll just really help you out. So. Thank you. And in our final moments, Miss, uh, I'm sorry, Miss Jesus, can you please close us out? Yes, thank you so much. First, I just want to say thank you to um, Hopkins School of Engineering. I'd love to say thank you to all of the panelists for all of the valuable information and insight and encouragement you shared with our students. Um, and I'd like to thank City Council President Mosby for being present with us and for his comments and from his perspective and how his experience in engineering really led him into a different career, but it was super valuable. So I just want to thank everyone for their expertise and their insights and their generosity of time sharing these things with our students today. Um, just a few things. I'm putting in the chat a link to 
um, a number of opportunities, upcoming opportunities through the work-based learning office. Work-based learning office is relatively new and our whole, um, our whole vision and mission is to connect young people in Baltimore City Public Schools with all of the, the vast career opportunities that exist through partnerships like this one and others with uh, those in the industry. Um, we have a couple of upcoming things that are listed on there that I'll just shout out. First of all, our career readiness newsletter will be coming out. It comes out monthly, and that's just chock full of all the sort of most recent opportunities. We'd encourage you to click on that link and to go there and to sign up for that newsletter so that you're always updated. And then every Friday, we are um, the second Friday of every month, we have our CTE Fridays, and they have a different theme, and we have different panelists, kind of similar to this one, and the upcoming theme is around transportation, we will have a civil engineer that will be on that panel. And so keeping the connection to engineering going, we'd encourage you to do that. And um, this video, and as well as many, many others are posted on our CCR playlist or College and Career Readiness playlist. The link to that is also in the document. And so we'd encourage all of those um, uh, that have, are either watching this live or that watch it later to go and take a look at that. And um, I just wanna echo and celebrate and lift up the, all of the really insightful um, panelists that talked about connection. Take this as like, if whatever was of interest to you, take one thing, one thing that was of interest to you, one thing that was a good idea and pursue that one thing or pursue that person, reach out. Um, people are eager to share their knowledge and their mentorship with our young people in the city. And um, so lean in and find that opportunity and go in pursuit of it. And um, so again, I just wanna thank everybody uh, that contributed to bringing all of this together and the time and uh, the investment of time and energy that went into it. We really believe in our young people's power and purpose. And we're so glad to find partners that also share that belief and will help them work towards it. So again, thank you so much on behalf of the work-based learning team of Baltimore City Schools.